Everything you ever wanted to know about HDTV but were afraid to ask. I'm David Gortz. Joining me is Alfred Poor of HDTV Almanac. It's our Father's Day special. If you want to buy an HDTV, this is the show for you. Well, there we go. It looks like all our pieces are running. Alfred, how are you? I'm great. Good to be here. Thanks so much <laughs> for inviting me. So we uh, we were talking about, is it possible to buy a TV that's too big? What do you think? Well, it's certainly possible. It's highly unlikely, though. Um, I mean, there are some TVs that are so big that you actually have to build the house around it. I know people who actually taken the roof off so they could lower a giant plasma screen in. But um, the the fact of the matter is it's very difficult to buy one that's too big. Uh, too big means that when you sit so close to it that you'll see the individual dots, the individual pixels, pixels in the image, uh, like sitting too close to the screen in the movie theater. Uh, and it's very unlikely that you'll, you'll get one that's too big. Much more likely is that people buy sets that are too small. So there you go. If you're talking about getting a gift for someone, never buy an HDTV that's tiny. You want one that's really, really big. And, and I mean, as somebody buying an HDTV, I mean, I, I can't imagine ever having an HDTV that's too, that's too big. I'd, I'd love one that, that projects across the whole side of my building or something. My wife, not so much, but uh, she, she likes our big, our big screen as well. So what is a good size for an HDTV? Are, are, are you looking at a 24-inch, a 65-inch, an 80-inch? How do you tell well, what fits? It's, it's a it's a it's basically a usage model but if what you're going for is in the immersive experience where you want to get the full benefit of the high definition content from your blu-ray or from your cable or, or other subscription service um, you want to think in terms of going to the movies not watching television I know that when I was growing up I was told not to sit closer to the TV than I could cover the image with my hand um, that doesn't apply for, for HD. Basically, you want, you want an image that surrounds you, like in the movie theater, so that you can get that, that full immersive experience. Uh, there are a lot of rules of thumb out there. Some people say, you know, up some multiple of the, the height of the screen, you should sit, sit that far away. Um, basically, uh, my rule of thumb is if you're going to be six feet away, you want, don't want anything smaller than about a 47-inch screen. Um, and it just goes up from there. So if you're going to be 10 feet away, 55 inch is probably about the right size. That's a lot larger than what people tend to think of. But um, in terms of getting close enough so that you get the, the immersive experience but not start seeing the pixels, those are two pretty good uh, reference points. Yeah, it's funny. When, when I grew up, the big screen, the big family screen was a 13 inch TV. Yeah. You know, and, and we watched it across the room, you know, and, and that was that was that was it. Of course, there wasn't you know, there weren't things like video games or any of those sorts of things at the time. And, and that's what also what I mean by usage model. Now, in the kitchen, you're not going to have a giant screen. I mean, it's there mostly for the audio because you're not going to be staring at the screen while you run around um, preparing food or whatever. And the things that you are going to watch, like weather reports and so forth. You, you don't need to see all that fine detail that you get in, H, in, in high definition. So, uh, you know, a 27, 32 inch screen in the kitchen makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, I'm a big believer that if you're playing something like Halo and you're not getting nauseous, the screen isn't big enough. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's all about immersion. Yeah, it really it's is. It, so that you actually feel like you're there. Well, let's, let's sw switch gears briefly because we haven't really asked who is Alfred Poor and, and how did you get to be such an expert about HDTV? Well, um, you know, in the in the land of blind men, the one-eyed man is king, right? Um, I just had a head start uh, years and years ago. Uh, <clears throat> I wrote for PC Magazine. I wrote for them for twenty some years, uh, and got involved in a lot of different kinds of hardware with them. I was involved in the very first printer project, uh, their, one of their full issues on on printers, years and years ago. And over year over time, I started doing uh, display technology for them and I ended up developing all their test protocols for PC Magazine Labs. Um, so when the 
computer magazine business started to wind down, um, you know, the people didn't care as much about the computer monitors, which one to buy because they didn't cost that much. Um, at the, about that time, people were spending four or five thousand dollars on an HDTV, and so all the knowledge that I had about display technologies translated directly into the the living room. So I set up shop as a, a an HDTV expert. Wrote wrote a book or two, and uh, I write the HDTV Almanac, which is a daily collection of news and commentary about HDTV topics as well as other home entertainment kinds of kinds of issues um, and it's a lot of fun I have I have a great time doing it but I'm still heavily involved in the the display industry in general so I get to spend a lot of time seeing what's over the horizon and and what's coming so let's let's segue to that briefly what is over the horizon what is coming well uh, for those who were at CES in Las Vegas last January they saw some pretty startling uh, demonstrations by Samsung and LG uh, both companies showed 55-inch OLED televisions. Now, OLED is O-L-E-D. It's not got nothing to do with LEDs. Um, it's a it's a whole different kind of of display technology. It's organic light emitting displays, and basically the key thing about it is that it's a a, a nanotechnology that uses thin films to create the image. Uh, unlike an LCD which where the the liquid crystal material acts as a shutter to pass or block the light the OLED material actually emits light itself much like the phosphors in your old-fashioned picture tube CRT television um, so you don't have a viewing angle problem the same way you have with LCDs uh, the colors are bright and and the thing can be about as thin as a single pane of glass uh, so it, it can just be tiny tiny thin um, as we saw when Sony brought their their first one out a, a number of years ago, but uh, the the thing about them is that when they're black, showing something black on the screen, that part of the screen actually turns off, so it really is black. It's not like an LCD oh. where it's blocking the light from the from the backlight behind it. So you get incredible contrast, which in turn makes the color look even better. Um, so it's it's very exciting, gorgeous, gorgeous. Uh, image quality and of course I'm not saying anything new if, to anybody who's got an OLED display in their smartphone for example um, a lot of the a lot of the high-end smartphones now have OLED displays and they look gorgeous there so if somebody's so, gonna go out and buy a, an HDTV let's say for Father's Day is, is OLED what they should be looking for is that more of a Christmas time well, first of all they're not gonna find it okay and secondly it is much more of a Christmas time purchase Probably Christmas time, 2015. Okay, <laughs> not 2012. Um, there's a whole lot of reasons for that, and some of this gets pretty technical. But one of the one of the key things is that uh, in order to create a, a pixelated display, in other words, one that's got a matrix of, of red and green and blue pixels, so that we can create a, a color image the way we do with LCDs and plasma and and all the other kinds of displays we're familiar with. Um, in order to do that, you have to have a, a way of switching those pixels on and off. And that's what, where they use an active matrix backplane. Active matrix meaning that it's active, it could, that each individual pixel can be switched on and off. And the way they do that is they actually form millions of tiny little transistors on the surface of the, the glass substrate before they put down the, the display material. Now, the problem is that OLEDs work by driving current through them. They, uh, the, the, the brightness is, varies by, by how much current goes through. So um, their need, the, the needs they have for their transistors are quite different than what you need for LCDs. And it turns out that the amorphous silicon that's used in almost every LCD display um, just isn't up to the task. Uh, so they need something better. Now, for those OLEDs that you have in your smartphones, they use a thing called uh, low temperature polysilicon. They actually take a laser and sort of half melt the silicon layer so it forms larger crystals so that it uh, moves more electricity easier. The problem is that's only good up to relatively small uh, substrates. You can't do the giant two foot, or I'm sorry, six foot by six foot or 
nine foot by nine foot substrates that you need to get to for large greens for to make them efficiently. So what they've come up with is a new, brand new, um, uh, active matrix backplane technology, and it's used using metal oxides, different combinations of zinc and other metals. Their oxides laid down a layer, and you can actually get a much better transistor built on that technology than you can on the standard amorphous silicon. The problem there is it's new. And which means LG, expensive and it means not available and it, well it may not be expensive. It actually could be very cheap. The materials really? are extremely cheap. Um, the the problem is that they haven't scaled it up yet. So we don't know, really know until they do it what kind of yields they're going to get. Um, and and whether it'll be aging problems. I mean there's lots of stuff that works in the lab but when you take it out and try to churn out, you know, 100,000 substrates a, a month, um, you know, you, you find problems that, that don't work so well. Well, speaking, uh, of things, uh, th speaking of things that are in the lab and, and may or may not work so well, I've been looking at, at this question of HD, um, or excuse me, 3D HD TVs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm thinking I wear glasses. I've worn glasses since I was like 12. A good percentage of our population does. It yep. seems to me that these 3D TVs are designed for people who don't need to wear glasses or that, you know, at some point we're going to have like little Nintendo DSs scaled up so that we can see these things in 3D. And what's the story? First off, is, is 3D a gimmick? Is it gone or, or do we not care? Okay. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, rumors of 3D TVs death are grossly exaggerated. Um, I'm a firm believer in 3D. Uh, you can still see it at the movie theaters every weekend. Um, the 3D versions of the shows outsell the 2D versions over and over again. It's clear that the, the average consumer enjoys watching stereoscopic 3D. Um, now, then we get to the question of those stupid, those stupid looking goggles, um, and or the goofy glasses, and and lots of people say uh, you know, they're not going to get 3D TV until they can get one that doesn't require the, the goofy glasses, and I certainly can understand that, and they are welcome to wait. The problem is they're probably going to wait forever, um, simply because based on the physics of of light and 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 human perception um, basically the way stereoscopic works is that it sends a different image to your left and your right eye and you need to have some way of separating the two images if you're not going to do it with glasses then you have to do it with space and that means I can't sit there on the sofa with my arm around my wife looking at a 3D screen and both of us see the 3D image because her uh, her left eye will be lined up where my right eye is, and so it, it just can't work. On the other hand, if you ta if you're looking at your wife and oops, there we go. Uh, if you're looking at your wife and you have a, uh, a a 3D image, you may see her in weird blue and red or something like that. Well, I would assume not with the blue and red anymore, because that was that's that's the, um, the old-fashioned way of doing it, and they don't they don't do that anymore. It's it's now done in in one of two ways. There's active glasses, which will block or transmit the light to one eye than the other. And that's the way most of the 3D TVs work. Is that what um, people should be buying now, or the active glasses? Well, my opinion is no. Okay. Um, they, they need to be charged, they're expensive, um, and if you already wear glasses, they can, they can be a pain. They're getting the way, you know, it, it's not easy to fit them over another pair of glasses. It's just not a very good solution. On the other hand, LG and Vizio and and I think Westinghouse offer something that they call the uh, uh, the, the pattern retarder, um, which is a uh, a film that they add to the screen. And what it does is polarizes the image in alternate ways. So one line's polarized one way, then the other line's polarized the other way, and they merge. So you put on the same kind of sunglasses that you wear at the local movie theater. One lens is polarized one way, and the other lens is polarized the other way. So each eye sees its own image off the screen all the time. Now, the beauty of this is you can get clip-ons for your prescriptions. You flip them up, flip them down. Um, and, and there's no reason why these glasses should cost any more than regular sunglasses. Ten bucks a pair or something, even less. So, um, uh, and in fact, 
a friend and colleague of mine, Ray Sinera, who has a company called DisplayMate. He's probably one of the, the best people in, as, in terms of independent testing of display technologies. And he did a shootout between two top brand active glasses uh, displays and two of these passive glasses displays. And in a number of important ways, the passive glasses actually look better. So when you hear the active glasses people saying, yeah, but you're only getting to see half the resolution, um, theoretically that's true. In a practical matter, it actually comes out sharper than, than if you're using the shutter glasses. So the, the key is to get the passive glasses then? Right. I think the passive glasses models are better. My, my expectation was that since they're actually adding material and another manufacturing step to the, to the, uh, the, the pr production process for, for the LCD panels, I was concerned that when they came out, they were going to be crazy more expensive. But in fact, you can get a Vizio uh, passive glasses 3D television with equivalent features to a Samsung model for hundreds and hundreds of dollars less. What about so the it, gap it can actually factor. cost less. Hmm? What about the GAC factor, the, the 3D makes people nauseous issue? Um, it's, it's not the, the, the television itself. It's the way that, it, in most cases, that's a, a function of how the content was encoded. Um, basically, what's happening is you're tricking your eyes. Your eyes are focusing on the distance to the screen, but they're thinking they're looking at something farther away or something in close. And so when you have to bring your eyes together to look at something close, but the focal length is somewhat longer, that gets confusing to your head. So if, it's, if you have too much negative Z, in other words, things coming out closer to you from the screen, that can trigger the, the, the headaches, the dizziness, the uneasy feeling. Um, so it's, uh, um, it's almost always a matter of, of how the, the, the programming was put together and, and not the technology necessarily itself. So it's not necessarily an issue on what TV you're buying. It's more right. like, are you watching Avatar or are you watching a remastered Rockford Files? Exactly. But don't knock the remastered Rockford file. The, the chances are there's a lot of money being spent. Right now, they're, when they do a 3D, even a new 3D, they spend a lot of time with human artists going very carefully frame by frame and tweaking individual aspects of, of, of the shot. There's a lot of people spending a lot of money on figuring out how to automatically convert 2D uh, uh, content existing 2D content into 3D. And they're getting very good at it, and it's, it's an incremental process, so each generation gets that much better, that much faster. And it's conceivable to me that within about two years, we're gonna be able to take Hollywood's back catalog for both movies and episodal television, and just turn the crank, and out comes plenty of, of 3D content that we'll wanna watch. Interesting. So, um. Now, speaking of, of visibility, your camera just knocked you a little out of focus. Can you just All lean right. back a bit and see, see if it decides to, to pick you back up? There we go. That looks a little better. Not, not yet. It's. Let me see if I can... For, for those of you paying attention to this, this is the challenge of doing a live uh, web TV-based Skype automated camera things. This is a, a webcam that thinks it's smarter than we are and uh, occasionally <laughs> decides to uh, to find its own focus. There you go. There we go. When, uh, uh, when I was I first chat with it on this end. There you go. When I first was setting up the studio, I, uh, I bought one of those little Logitech things and it decided it, I mean, maybe it looked at my face and figured I needed to be blurred out, but no matter what I did, it would blur me out after I got it focused. So, uh, so okay, we're talking about the, 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 um, 3D, but I have an interesting question. I'm a, a fan of the old school DLP TV. I have a I have a 65 mm -hmm. inch old school DLP TV, and what I like about it is I've had this thing for seven years. I keep it on almost constantly because we use it not only for uh, entertainment but also for uh, work. You know, I'll write, I, I write a lot of my articles out on it when I'm not sitting at my desk. And, you know, every two or three years I replace the lamp and boom, it's good mm -hmm. as new. For 99 bucks, I have a brand new, fully functional TV. Yep. Are the TVs that people are buying now, will they last as long and be as bright for the same amount of money? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, um, laser. I mean, uh, plasma these days has has extremely long life. Uh, LCD, uh, especially the LED models, you know, they're rated at fifty to sixty thousand hours to half brightness. Um, so that's going to be way longer than anybody's going to want to keep them. I mean, that's you know, easily ten years typical usage. So let's so, talk about that for a second. If somebody's sure. going to go out and buy a, a let's, let's just say they want to go buy a 60 inch um, HDTV, because if you're going to buy a 24 inch HDTV, it doesn't really matter. You're spending a hundred bucks and you have no taste. So you're going to buy a 60 inch. Oh, <laughs> it could be a personal display for just you in a, in a dorm or, you know, in an office. So, I mean, there's, there's a, there's Oops, a role for 24 on one second. Inches. We just lost one sound thing. I want to bring it back on. Are you there? I'm still here. There you go. Okay. So you could say it could be for a dorm. I've been trying to put one in my bathroom. My wife thinks that's not a good idea. Oh no no no! Don't don't get don't get a standalone television. Get one of the mirrors that has a uh, an LCD embedded in it. Oh, there you go. It takes no space. Takes up no space, and if you don't turn it on, she won't know it's there. <laughs> that's a plan. That that's that works. <laughs> so if, if somebody's going to go out and buy uh, an HDTV, let's say they're, they they want to buy a, a gift. Uh, or they want to buy themselves a gift right now. Is it plasma? Is it LCD? Is it LED? Is it Vizio? Is it Samsung? Is it sure. three? You know, what are they buying? What, How much should they spend? What's the sweet spot? Yeah, okay. there you go. Um, all right. First of all, let's break it down. Plasma versus LCD. Don't buy plasma. Um, plasma's gone. Uh, it's all over but the shouting. Um, all the forecasts have plasma steady, steady they're not just their market share, but actually their, their total unit um, forecasts are slowly to, are set to slowly continue to slowly decline over the next few years. All the growth is going to be in LCD and eventually OLED. Um, but uh, for now, plasma is just not practical. The one exception is if you're building a man cave, and you've got a way to control the ambient lighting and you can turn the lights all the way down, then plasma makes sense um, because it does have excellent blacks much better than almost all the LCDs have. And so you can, you can get an excellent image quality out of plasma, but you have to turn the lights down. If you're going to have it in the family room and you want to watch Sunday afternoon football and the light streaming in, you're going to be disappointed with plasma. So for 99% of the people, plasma is not the answer. That leaves us with LCD. Now, some people say, should I buy an LCD or an LED? Well, there are no LED TVs. Um, it's uh, one of those marketing inventions. Now, I, I, uh, I swear I've seen direct LED TVs advertised everywhere. There, there, uh, there's a new thing called that they're calling direct LED, but in neither case are they LED TVs. An LED TV would be like those giant scoreboards at the the, the baseball uh, baseball field, um, where they have a you know giant matrix of LEDs emitting light directly and 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 making the image. When people talk about LED in a flat panel HD TV, they are always talking about an LCD TV. LCD TVs require a light behind them. In fact, a very very bright light. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but if you put up a, a full white screen on your LED screen uh, the, on, on the panel, at least 95% of the light from the backlight is being blocked by the panel, even when it's showing white. It's an extremely inefficient technology and chews up a lot of light in the profit process. So the problem is you need to have this bright car headlight shining all the time behind the LCD panel so that you can see any image at all. The traditional way of getting that light was using fluorescent tubes, compact fluorescent tubes that would snake around behind the panel and emit the light that you need to get the image. Uh, years ago, they started experimenting with LEDs, which are solid state lights, so they don't wear out. Or they, I mean, they do, but they last a lot longer than the fluorescents do. They don't have the mercury that you have in fluorescent tubes, so they're uh, better for the environment. And they're more energy efficient, at least in theory. So you can save some energy using LEDs. The problem at the time was LEDs were way more expensive than the, the, the fluorescent. And it wasn't until recently that the world production capacity of LEDs 
really outrun the demand, ran, outran the demand, so we have a, a pretty big oversupply. So right now is not a bad time to design LEDs into products like light bulbs and things like that. So the, the, definitely LEDs have an advantage over fluorescent in general. Now within LEDs, there are two choices to make. And that's the question of where are the LEDs placed in the display in order to get the light behind the, the, the LCD panel. And one place to put them is along the edge of the display, and the other one is directly behind them. Now, the reason for putting them along the edge is you get a very thin display. This is how you get those displays that are you know half inch thick or even or even less. Um, they have extremely sophisticated light management layers behind there, including a, a, a light guide that steers all that light from the edges and distributes it evenly, so there are no bright spots. It distributes it evenly across the back of the LCD. So as you can think about it, that's that's a pretty sophisticated, complex bit of engineering. And that's primarily why these thin sets cost so much more. A relatively new development within the past three to six months has been the direct LED. And that's not talking about making the image directly from the LEDs, it's talking about the backlight being direct. And what they've done is they've taken less expensive LEDs and fewer of them and put them about an inch behind the liquid crystal panel and the light shines from uh, shines out from them there. They also tend, there's no reason f uh, from a, a physics point of view why they, they need to be dimmer. They tend to be dimmer just because they use less expensive LEDs and fewer of them. So it do they don't put out quite as much light as the edge edgelets ones do. So. For, this, for these reasons, the, the thicker case, fewer LEDs, lower quality LEDs, and um, uh, you know, the, their, their space back further from the LCD, um, they are now pretty much the low cost option for flat panel screens. Are they a sweet spot? Are they a smart purchase? Or are they just something that lets the manufacturer's cost reduce? Um, I, I would say that they're uh, a, a reasonable budget choice. Um, the thing about the thin LCD that I, I've never really gotten is that it's the one attribute of the television that you can't tell when you're actually using it. The only time you can tell how thick the, the TV is is when you're looking at it from the side and then you can't see the picture. So um, I've never really quite gotten the fascination about the, the thin screen except that they look, they look cool um, when they're turned off. But so I mean, if you're looking to save some money I, the, the, the bigger issue is, you know, often they'll tend to be available from some of the, the lower brands, uh, some of the entry price point brands, and they may use a, a lower quality LCD panel. So I would say you want to look very carefully at them to make sure that the image quality is, is up to what you want. But um, just because it's a, a direct lit LED uh, backlight doesn't rule it out automatically in my in my book. Are they a safe purchase? A safe purchase? You mean in terms of well, in other words, if you're if you're going to spend a thousand dollars on a TV, right, and you're getting this yeah. direct LED, is it because you're let's say you're you're able to spend four hundred dollars less than if you're doing it through a non-direct LED and it's a little thicker? Are you going right. to have a TV that's going to last? Is it decent quality? Oh, yeah, I mean, if the quality is there to begin with, it'll be there throughout. Now, what so, about these off-brand TV? What are, you know, go to Walmart, you buy an off-brand mm -hmm. Kobe TV or whatever that right. looks vaguely like a Sony. Are these, are these? And unfortunately, the off-brands now include good names like Kodak, Philips, um, yeah. Magnavox. I mean, you know, a lot of those names no longer have anything to do with the company that you and I knew. Mm -hmm. um, those names have been auctioned off or licensed or whatever and made available to to other other companies. Um, there's a, uh, a Chinese LCD panel maker who has the licensing rights to like a dozen um, different brand names that, and many of which are sold in this country. And um, they, by and large, they're, they're, they're in the industry. It's called OPP for open, opening price point. And so these will be the, the the lowest price models. They'll have fewer features and they'll have lower quality components, including the LCD panel. So one of the things I look for when I'm looking at these is I look at the off-axis viewing. In other words, stand off about 45, 60 degrees to the side and see if the contrast changes or the color changes. 
um, in many cases you'll find one or both will happen and, and in, in, in the worst case scenario the colors can actually reverse and mm. um, yeah I mean it gets pretty ugly so you can tell very quickly just walking down the aisle at Walmart um, you know and just look look from an angle as you approach each one and watch how they change um, it, also it's very key to look at the black areas um, uh, in just straight on in general but also from an angle you want as deep a black as you can get think you know black velvet at midnight on a, on a moonless night is that's, it smarter to buy something that's a little bit smaller but higher quality or a little bit bigger but maybe a little less quality if you don't care quite as much about the quality will they last as long or are you looking at something that's going to die much faster no they should all last they all should last about the same uh, though again uh, the ones with the cheap components you do run more of a risk of them dying sooner um, and getting support for them may be more difficult than with a, a, a top tier brand um, in general yeah, I would base the you know take the risk based on the retailer, not the brand. You now, if you feel that the retailer is going to stand behind it and exchange it if it breaks or get it fixed or whatever, then I I wouldn't be uncomfortable about taking the risk on that. Oh. Now the um, the the question of quality over size is a good one. Um, one of the things to remember is that the majority of the American viewers are sitting at home watching DVDs on their HD TV. Mm -hmm and think they look great. Um, a DVD is standard definition. It's not high definition. Even if you have an upscaling DVD player, it's it's still inventing pixels that it doesn't, you know, that aren't there. Um, the only way to get true high definition is either on Blu-ray or from your TV service, over the air or cable or satellite or, or whatever. Um, you're not getting, you're not getting full high definition from a DVD, but many Americans are totally satisfied with it and, and think it looks fine. So um, I don't, I, I try not to judge, you know, people's tastes. Um, my, my advice is, you know, rather than take my word for what looks good is to go into the store and look, your, look for yourself and see the things that, you know, look good to you or, or don't look good. Let's but, talk about the store for a second, because sure. when, uh, seven years ago when I bought this TV. We actually went through four of them because mm -hmm. we, we bought a, a DLP and it had that sort of spinny moire effect that my wife saw and it made her dizzy so we brought that one back and then we bought another one that was great except it died in a day and so we brought that one back and we went back yep. and forth but of course at the time down here at least in the middle of nowhere Florida there were a few stores where you could actually buy a large HD TV and bring it back. Those stores no longer exist and so now most people are faced with Amazon or Newegg or the mail or retailers. And do we still have yeah. the, the, the problem of dead pixels and what do you do if it's DOA and who pays for its shipping? What's, what's the right way to buy an HD TV in a world where there's no longer much, much large scale retail? Well, personally, I, um, I would prefer to buy, uh, buy locally or you know, whatever passes for locally. I mean that includes Best Buy and the other club stores. It also, I mean, Best Buy is the big box store, but you also have Costco and um, other club stores, and they tend to have good prices and good selections that are that are very similar to what you can get online. And many of the stores also allow you to order online and pick up at the store. Um, so you you know you do have some of that best of both worlds of the the, the online purchase and then but having a, a local entity that you can take it back to and and ask for help and 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 hopefully get them to fix it. That's why uh, I start off with you know you want to make sure that you've got some faith in the the retailer that you're buying from um, that you're not you know uh, you you buy yeah. from Seventh Luck Much Happiness uh, <laughs> Electronics from from someplace in New York City. Yeah, you're on your own. Yeah, I know those people personally, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to live in New Jersey, so uh, we go yeah. way back. Yeah. Um, so what about these smart TVs? I, I mean, you know, a TV that essentially has an Apple TV and a Roku built inside of it and, you know, potentially has whatever DRM they want and all. Are, are 
they scare me. I like a TV that's a TV, not one that's trying to be smarter than than I am. Um, but it looks like more and more TVs are getting apps and app-based services. What what do you recommend? Okay. Well, first of all, I love them. I think I I think I mean I I spend we probably spend maybe up to two thirds of our time watching streaming content over the internet as opposed to live on the air or, or what we've recorded from our subscription video service. Um, and so I think smart TVs are a great idea. Um, they, you know, a, a, to me, a Netflix streaming subscription is one of the biggest bargains available in television right now. Well, what I mean is a smart TV where, where like the, the smarts are built into the TV as opposed right. to like an ad on Apple TV or a Roku. So, so, here, so here's the deal. I, each one is its own version of a walled garden. Each one has its own applications that may or may not let you add more apps to it. Um, it may or may not have the apps you want. Um, and so it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, a question. I mean, you, you need to look at what is included to make sure that it matches what you are interested in um, before you, you shell out for it. <clears throat> On the other hand, I don't have any problem with buying a dumb TV if it's got everything else I want. You know, if it's priced the way I want it and it's got all the other features I want, um, I'm perfectly happy buying a dumb TV because it's only going to cost me $60, $70 to add the smarts to it using a Roku or Western Digital or Apple or, you know, any one of, any one of those. Uh, I, I call them um, network media players. And some people call them set-top boxes, but I think that can gets confusing because that's what you call the thing that hooks up to your cable or satellite service. Yeah, not so to I mention if your TV is device. only like that thick, you're not going to have a box on top of it. Right, <laughs> right. It'll be next to it. <laughs> but um, Or you glue it to the back. But so I think, I think smart TV is a great feature, and I think you shouldn't eliminate a set just because it doesn't have it because you can get it so cheaply elsewhere now today, and add it to it. Should people the, be – I'm sorry, go ahead. The the, the 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 fact is though very soon um, getting a TV without 3D or smart features is going to be like trying to buy a car with a manual transmission and no air conditioning. Um, it's just not going to be an option. It costs that you know the marginal cost of building it in um, isn't that great, and uh, the, the you know the top manufacturers are manufac are migrating these features all the way down throughout their entire product model lineup. And so you're going to find that, that the smart TV features and the 3D features are going to be standard on most of the, the mainstream televisions in a couple of years. So. so does that mean that they're going to be reducing the number of external inputs so that you have to get your Amazon video through them so they get a cut of it? Or are you going to have, be able to no. like plug in your boxes anyway if you want them? No, I think, I think they're going to get spanked if they don't put, you know, Three or four HDMI connections on the back. Um, uh, the 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 in intriguing thought that I have. I mean, I haven't seen any signs of this. This is pure speculation on my part, but it was um, prompted by the the IKEA announcement. Did you hear, hear no, about, I didn't hear about uh, the IKEA announcement? IKEA has announced an Upleva television. <laughs> really? <laughs> yep. Comes in three sizes. It includes the coffee table. The oh coffee yes, table. yes, I did see that. The coffee table has a Blu-ray player built in, and you know, is it 120 hertz? Is it 3D? Is it smart? I don't know. Who cares? It's you know, you just go in, you buy the boxes, you take it home, you put it together, and you've got a television. It's it's remarkable to me that a fact a furniture company is selling uh, is selling televisions. Now we had television companies selling furniture. I mean, those big mm -hmm. Magnavox consoles that look so great, or Zenith. You know, those were wonderful. But there's still the, the electronics company selling the furniture. And this is the other way around. Yeah. And what has me intrigued is um, we already have so many smarts in the living room already. Your set-top box could very easily handle all the streaming tasks from the Internet. And in, in many cases, they're doing that already. Mm -hmm. um, it's also got DVR, DVR functions in it. If not built into it, uh, it calls home to the mothership where the, the content is stored there. Um, your Blu-ray players, um, many of them are are now smart TV enabled. Uh, many people have an Xbox in their living room now, and those are one of the leading sources for streamed video uh, over the internet. So you don't really need 
any smarts. And on almost nobody gets over the air television anymore. There's only 10% of the US homes that use over the air, or use over the air exclusively. And among the other 90%, most don't bother with over the air television. Uh, we're, we're here, we're dinosaurs. We, we still use over the air, but uh, we're, the, we're the exception to, for the most part. Um, yeah, we have two so, TiVos, we have an Apple TV, we have a Netflix account, we have an Amazon video account, a PS3, an Xbox. So, you know, we, we, we can, and, 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 a, and a great big media center TV box that we so, built, yeah. you know, because we're, you know, we're geeks. So we have right, all that. Exactly. So my question is, you walk into the Verizon phone store or the T-Mobile or Radio Shack or any of those places, you're not paying the full rate for that telephone. It's subsidized by the by the wireless provider. How far are we from Comcast providing a, a a dumb television for five bucks a month on top of your contract, or ten bucks a month, or whatever? You know, Why does that inches? terrify me? I mean, with the the DVR that that our our local um, our, our local Comcast or, or yep. uh, you know um, cable provider is terrible. The idea mm -hmm. of a TV provider. Uh, actually, um, back when HDTV first came out, Dish Network loaned me uh, an HDTV, one of the very earliest HDTVs, and this thing was was tube, so it was huge and thick right. and ginormous, and it was terrible. Its quality was horrible. Yeah. So it is an interesting but, idea about the contract, but I also I wonder what kind of quality you'd see out of those things. Well, it could be any it could be any level of quality. You know, I mean, there's there's no reason why they couldn't get a good one, and if they're stripping out all the all those electronics. They don't need a scaler. Mm -hmm. They don't need a tuner. They don't need, um, you know, they, they don't need all those HDMI inputs. They don't need all the switching. They just have one HDMI in, input and let the, the set top box or the Blu-ray player do the switching. You Makes know, sense. it's a, uh, it, it could, it could be. So there's, there's a possible future for you. So we're at summer 2012 right now. We may come back and do this again in Christmas time or next summer yep. or whatever, but. We're looking at 1080p. We're looking at HDMI 1.4 1, 1. now. People should be looking for. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, you know, yeah, do we care? H, H, no, you don't care. The, the difference between HDMI 1.3 and 1.4 isn't going to make a difference for most people at this point. Um, the my recommendation is buy a little bigger than you think you should. Uh, we sit we sit about six feet from the screen, so we're in the market for a 47 inch. I Definitely recommend that you buy 3D now. If you're buying a new TV now, get 3D because you don't want 3D now necessarily, and you may not want it next year. But this is a set that you're going to keep for at least five years, and more likely ten. Um, if not as your primary, you're going to you're going to move it into a secondary location, and it's going to carry out another five or ten years there. So you're going to have this for a long time, and I guarantee you. Before that time is over, the Super Bowl will be broadcast live in 3D. So, and when that happens, everybody's going to want 3D. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that will be you know a measure of 3D's ar has arrived, and there'll be enough content to make it worth having. So, summarizing uh, this stuff up, we're looking at 1080p. We're looking at LCD. LCD. We're looking at 3D passive. If yep. we're talking, and we're looking yep. at um, not necessarily direct LED, LED, but it could be. Yep. Um, we're looking at making sure we look at the viewing angle for what we're buying. So let's say we're buying a 45-inch TV or a 60-inch TV. Is there a brand we should go to? Is there a price we okay. should expect to pay? Okay. Um, now, th this is my PC Magazine Labs training coming to the fore. Oh, and one other I, thing. We, you yeah. also said buy it locally if you can. Well, buy it from a retailer that you trust. Right. And it, in most cases, that's going to be a, a local. But you know, there's certainly a lot of online companies that are very strong on service, and you know can can do an excellent job of supporting you. So, but it's a, a matter of picking one that that you trust. Um, the so names, give me names. So so in terms of brands, I haven't tested uh, specific models in a long, long time. So I can't make any specific recommendations about which one to buy, which one is best. However, I will say that um, you're not going to go wrong buying from what I would call the, the major brands. Right now, LG and Samsung are the two leaders. Um, uh, if you want passive 3D, 
uh, you can go with LG. Um, uh, so those would be two of the top choices. Uh, they're the big market share leaders. They're not going to go away anytime soon, uh, like uh, some of the others have and 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 maybe will. Pioneer got out of the business years ago. Philips got out of the business. There's you know a whole bunch of companies that have, have bailed on it what for are good these reason. What cheap Vizios that we keep seeing? Oh well, now okay, so Vizio isn't cheap, but it's inexpensive. Okay. Uh, um, Vizio is a, has a, has a special position uh, in in my view. Um, it uh, is lower priced because they have worked very hard at vertically integrating their supply chain. Um, the guy, one of the guys behind it, is the, uh, one of the founders of Gateway, and so he understands about developing a, a production chain that helps drive out cost. Um, they're not perfect, but um, certainly a Vizio unit would be be on my short list of, of products to consider. They have a lot of innovative technology in them. They were the first ones. They actually came out with the the passive glass. 3D TV before LG did. LG makes their panels, but mm -hmm. um, but uh, they actually got out first with the product. So they're um, they're innovative. They're um, they do have they they have their their smart TVs are are very smart um, and have a lot of nice features about it. They spend a lot of time thinking about and working on um, uh, the user interface and controls. So I, I would definitely put them on the list among the the, the bargain. Uh, brands that you would see. Um, most of them I'd stay away from. Um, you won't need me to tell you that because you'll know it just by looking again at viewing mm -hmm. angle and black levels. Um, however, there are two brands at the opening price point that you might want to take a look at. One is Westinghouse, which again is a brand that has nothing to do with the original Westinghouse. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a licensed brand name, but they do tend to make some very good good products. And the other one that I would recommend you look at would be Insignia, really? which is the house brand of Best Buy. And some of the, it, they blow hot and cold. You know, some of the units are well designed using good components, some of them not so much. Um, but I wouldn't walk past the Insignia in your size and price range just because it has that brand on it. I'd, I'd stop and give it, a, give it a look. Interesting. So what do you have at home? I've got an old rear projection t TV that I'm waiting for the bulb to get so dim that it, um, I have to go out and replace the whole set because I'm not going to put the money into a new bulb on this one. Um, uh, it's it's an old Epson um, LCD wow. rear projection, so that's that's that tells you how old it is. What about projection TVs? Are projection TVs a, a valid choice? I bought a, a little hundred and forty dollar projector that attaches to my iPhone. Mm -hmm. And I can project bad bad versions of MacGyver on the ceiling in the bedroom wall in bed. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but what about real projection TVs? Is that is real that projection is, TVs. Is, is that passe? Not real. No. Real. It is absolutely real. Um, again, it's like plasma. It's a very niche market. Mm -hmm. um, front. We're talking about front projection here. Um, in other words. Hang, uh, I'm talking about we, hanging on the wall and shooting it at a, a white wall. Shooting it at a white white or silver screen. Yeah. Um, you can get them with 3D. Um, you you can get all. I mean, there's they've got all the features you want, and you can get them with fancy lenses that will actually give you the cinema correct aspect ratio for cinemascope. Um, so if you're interested in a home theater installation, um, front projection remains the the gold standard. Um, but that's if you're committing to you know committing a room solely to that. Yeah, it's, and you have to hang it right and place it right. Everything you hang else. it right and you've got cable issues and you're probably going to, well Epson, Epson has some very interesting products that um, are, have the, the screen and the speakers and the projector and the cable chases and everything you need and you can put it up in an afternoon. Um, but that's the exception. A, a lot of the high-end and, and I mean, there are projector systems that you can spend forty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars on. So I mean, it, it, there's no upper limit to to how much you can invest in these things. But when you're talking at that level, you're you're really talking about a system that's going to be professionally installed and maintained. So it, you're going to have to make quite a commitment to to make that work for you. Well, 
let's wrap this up then, and let me ask you sort of the the the, the end game question of this. Um, We've heard about, uh, let's see, um, we've heard about 4K TVs. Apple, of course, is supposed to revolutionize the TV world with, you know, their iMac in a box or whatever the heck they're supposed to be coming out with. That, you know, what what is the future? Do we do we wait for Apple to to iPhoneify our TVs for some ungodly reason? Do we, you know, do we wait for 4K TVs? Do we just buy this thing and 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 throw it out in five years? What's what's what, where, where are we going and where, what's the okay. next stage? Okay, 3D is coming for sure, and you'll want to have 3D eventually. Um, almost everybody will, and so we'll, we'll take that as a given. 4K, which is shorthand for 4,000 pixels across, I mean, it's basically um, the equivalent of taking four 1080p sets and gluing them together uh, to make one big one. Um, the Japanese have been working on this for, for quite a while. Uh, it's definitely a, a, an interesting technology, but I don't think that there's going to be much pull for it. I don't think there's going to be a, a whole lot of demand. The switch in this country from analog to digital broadcasting made HD much more viable and provided a, a, an inflection point for everybody to switch televisions. I don't think we would see the same thing if all of a sudden 4K became available. Um, I don't think it's that much better. And again, people are watching DVDs on their HD mm. and very happy with it. And you need so a lot I more processing power too. I don't. Yeah, I, I just don't think that the extra, just because we build it, doesn't mean that that people are going to want it. So I, I don't expect that to become a new standard for at least 10, 15 years, um, maybe more. The, the, the other part of that is you also have to be able to deliver four times the, the amount of data to that set. And we just don't have the infrastructure to deliver that at this point. So I'm not, not concerned about 4K. Um, Apple TV I won't talk about because it's not real. Um, <laughs> as soon as somebody can come up with something that's not innuendo conjecture or something that they read on somebody else's blog, I'll be happy to talk about it. But um, Well, let me ask you a question about that because I, I have to ask the question. Is, the TV business is, is essentially moribund in a lot of ways. Is there really yeah. even a reason for anybody to care beyond the Apple TV box? I mean, the Apple TV box is is, is growing more and more strategic. We just saw that, um, what is it, mountain lion, calf lion, mountain goat, whatever the new yeah. version of lion is, will now allow the, the, the Max to project to the Apple TV. And, you know, you can do it from the retina display and you can do it from the iPhone. So the Apple TV box, the little $100 thing, looks like right. it's going to be around for a while. But is there even a market opportunity for Apple to be selling, you know, generic big TVs with a little bit of processing in it? Um, they have a fan base. They have a market. One of the hardest things to do in any business is to get a new customer. One of the easiest things to do is to sell it to an existing customer. Apple's got a large installed base who will be predisposed in favor of of any Apple product, so maybe they can make some money on selling TVs where nobody else can. Um, it, it remains to be seen. I, I think it's possible that they may bite off more than they can chew trying to step into this market because it's bloody, and I, I don't think they've ever Apple's ever competed in an established market. Um, where the margins are so thin as they are here. Do you think so, this is a more bloody market than the phone market? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like to say the only people making money in the television market is UPS because <laughs> <laughs> they deliver them. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's just it. it uh, I was at the Display Week conference last week, the Society for Information Display, and. One analyst was pointing out that nobody's made a dollar yet out of LCD panels. Um, really? All the revenues that have been earned have been farmed back into more production capacity. So uh, it's um, uh, it, it, it's a really, really tough business to be in. So give so, us some, uh, some final thoughts. Anything you want to tell us about where you are, where you can be read, any final sure. piece of advice? Sure. Um, um, I, what should people well, do in the next couple of weeks? You know, that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, if you want to find me, it's um, I'm go to hdtvalmanac.com and you'll find my 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 almanac column. Um, 
And uh, if you have questions, feel free to write me, alfred at hdtvprofessor.com. And I'm always welcome, you know, reader questions and listener questions. So um, feel free to write and I'll do my best to answer. Um, uh, is one of the questions that everybody asks is, is this a good time to buy? There you and, go. and I would say right now we're looking at an excellent time. Um, the situation is that the 2012 models are beginning to ship and there's still plenty of 2011 models lying around and there's nothing wrong with them. And uh, inventory is an issue for the retailers. It's a huge issue for the manufacturers. It's also an issue for the, the components suppliers, including the LCD panel makers. So a lot of people ha are carrying a lot of product on their books and they'll be very happy to sell them right now because there's nothing that's going to push HDTVs out the door until football season starts. Baseball doesn't drive it. Uh, the Olympics have never driven it. Everybody hopes for the Olympics to drive sales, but it's never happened. Well, what about the presidential uh, conventions? I mean, that's got to be a reason. We already know how they turn out. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I've heard this story before. Um, no, so until football season starts, you know, the, the television retailers are really facing a, a, a long summer drought. So it's a fine time to walk in mm -hmm. and, and try to strike a deal. And do not do not believe the price on the sticker as being the ultimate price, uh, even even in the big chains. Really? You'll find that yeah you'll you'll find that you know if you go in and you ask if you're nice and polite about it and um, you know that you may well be able to find a manager or somebody who will be able to knock a few more points off it or throw something else in throw in that stand you needed or whatever. Um, don't be afraid to bargain uh, because you can. Because the alternative is you'll go to the web and buy it for the same price or less. So mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, they're they need the cash. I can't so. think of a better way to end this interview than to say, <laughs> "Don't be afraid to bargain." They need don't the cash. Don't be afraid to bargain. Go buy yeah. an HDTV for for yourself or a friend. Alfred, thank you so much. You've been really patient. You've given us a great interview and some really tangible things. I think people can go back and and use right away. Great. Well, I'm glad I could help. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That is Alfred Poor. Uh, he is at HDTV Almanac, and what a great interview. Thank you, Alfred.